Hey everybody, thanks for joining us at SlowConf. I'm here today with Abby Bangser, and we're going to talk about just say no. You don't need more dashboards. So my name is Zach Nickens. I'm an SRE at Boxboat Technologies. You can find me on Twitter at the underscore Nickens. And I'm Abby Bangser, and I'm an SRE at Duffel, and I'm on Twitter as a underscore Bangser. So today we're going to talk about why we don't need more dashboards. You need the right information, not more information. So, Abby, I know you feel strongly about this. Um, why do you think we need the right information and not just more information? I think with dashboards, they have the risk of becoming um, what somebody well stated as the scar tissue of past incidents and past issues, right? So you end up having to go digging for these interesting problems, these interesting issues, and you end up creating uh, graphs to be able to find those problems from your metrics. And then once you've created this graph that took you all this time and solved you this really complex problem, you then feel like you need to keep it. It solved this problem. You, you probably will need it again. You should probably put it on a dashboard somewhere and make sure that that problem never comes back. And that's when you end up with this just kind of explosion of, of different dashboards of different graphs that actually may not be relevant to the future problems you're going to come across. Uh, and I think it's thinking about what are those future problems that will come up and that you'll want to be able to explore more easily that's going to give you the most value. Yeah, absolutely. It becomes finding a needle in a haystack problem. Um, and, you know, I'm just as guilty as anybody. Um, I hoard data, right? Like anything <laughs> that happens, I want to hoard data about it. And so, you know, it becomes a problem where I, we can't find what we need. Um, and so information is really what we're after, right? We're after meaningful information and not just raw data points that don't correlate to anything that we're looking for. Um, and I know you always tell me that, you know, information is greater than data and that, you know, we really need to be able to explore that data and derive that information. I know, you know, I know you have thoughts on this. Yeah, I think that it's about the the power of creating these dashboards is taking our human brains, our understanding of what matters to our systems, what matters to our users and applying it so that when we are in a crunch moment, we're not having to create raw Prometheus queries, you know, if we don't have to, that we have already kind of put those, the important information in front of our eyes uh, to, to allow us to jumpstart that investigation. Uh, and so I think that's what that pre-thought of a dashboard is, is worth. Awesome. So explorable over sta static, right? Like it's always best to be able to explore your data. Um, you know, I know that like if I'm looking at static data points when I'm responding to something, it's not telling me the whole story, right? And so like, you know, how do you use explorable data, uh, you know, when you respond to an incident or an interruption? Well, this is definitely my wheelhouse. Uh, my background is in software testing, and we talk a lot about the value of automated testing, but we also need to look at the value of exploratory testing or just humans going and looking for, complex problems that you couldn't imagine beforehand or you couldn't you didn't imagine to put into your automated test suite yet. And I think that's what we're doing all the time when we're responding to live incidents, right? We're responding to things that we could not have imagined, we did not build into our expectations when building our systems. And so I think when you have a a situation where the dashboards that you have are are hard to play with. They are something where making a change to them either uh, is difficult or impossible, depending on the permissions of the tool. You end up with a situation where engineers don't try and explore the data as freely um, during their development process, during kind of just downtime during the day and during the week. And so you, you lose a little bit of that curiosity bug if you don't get to play in the data on a regular basis. And so I think that being able to explore the data allows you the chance to solve these complex, unexpected problems in production, but it also just breeds a culture of people tinkering with, you know, what does the data look like? What if we added another label to that metric? What if we added a different graph or we, we compared these graphs in a different way? You know, what would that give us? And, and that will, result in even more powerful dashboards, even more powerful playgrounds as people work with them. I love it. I love it. You know, like I always preach to SREs that 
well-tested code is better code, right? Like it's like, that's what makes SRE life much better, right? It's not any specific tool. It's better code, right? Like writing better code makes SRE life better and tested code is better than non-tested code. So, you know, a lot of times we talk about uh, correlation between metrics and logs and, and bringing additional levels of correlation between what we see in our metrics and what we're able to see in our logging solutions. Um, this is a this is a huge huge topic uh, that I touch on a lot when I am training new SREs of saying like hey you know as you're building you know be cognizant of what your metrics say but then also you have to correlate that back to the logs and so especially when we're building software is to get the best log messages out of our software as we can it I know that this is an, another part of your background in testing that you you know this is your bailiwick. <laughs> yeah, I think, as you said, it's so important. And, and I do want to hear more about how you, you train this in, but it's about that explorability. The metrics provide us that oversight, that idea of what might be happening, where things might be hot spots might be, but it can't tell you what the exact problem is uh, or the exact experience that users are having. That's what your logging solution can provide you. So the the more correlated, but also just the more ingrained those two solutions can be, the more that you can have a single brain, a single muscle working across these two different solutions, the more that you're going to be able to get value from them because you'll be able to go from those details back up to the, the high level and back down into details more freely. And that's that exploration again. Yeah. But so so how, how do you build this in? How do you so kind of bring this to teams? One of the ways that I found success in build, kind of building this into that SRE muscle is by uh, building a system where all of my all of our developers and all of our SREs have access to metrics and logs in their development environments, in their local build environments, so where they can spin one up really quickly. It's uh, it's a system that it's going to, no matter where we're looking at logs and metrics, uh, whether it's dev, test, or staging, or prod, it's always the same tool set. And, you know, I'm like, hey, yeah, logs can be expensive, but that's a price we're going to pay. We're going to make sure that we have this in our dev environments. And so that if it's there, we train people on how to use that, that logging system. They get used to using it, and then they build that correlation over time as they build that muscle. Uh, that seems to be what works best for my group. Um, I think that's amazing. Yeah. So like signal and noise, right? Like get tuned in, not drowned out, right? Like it's, it's, it's critical, I think, uh, especially when I'm training a new SRE, um, and trying to convert, say, a developer into an SRE and teach them that, so that signal. It's like, um, you know, you don't necessarily need a debug turned on in all of your environments, right? You will get drowned out, right? You need to get tuned in and find the places, find those correlations of what's really important. And I think that also applies to metrics, right? Like it's, if we have, you have too many metrics, you have too many dashboards, can't find what is really meaningful to you. Um, so do you see any uh, carryover in that kind of experience in, in your testing background all the way through to your, your SRE work that you do now? Yeah, I think it comes out in that earlier conversation around uh, information being more than data, right? We're so hungry to, to store all of our data, whether it be personal data, like how much we store multiple copies of photographs everywhere and multiple, you know, just my uh, my storage, cloud storage is ballooning, but also just at work, we want to store every piece of information. We want to add info level logging, debug level logging on everywhere. Um, but in reality, that's a lot of data that we often then end up ignoring. So I've, I've followed up sometimes on the no noisier log lines with teams. And it turns out that those were things that maybe they used when they were first developing, uh, but now they, they don't. And that scale is just too much for them to even look at. And so I think that's that's quite common. So dashboard watching is bad, right? Like that's ultimately, uh, you know, when I'm, you know, training new SREs or helping an organization adopt an, an SRE practice, like this is one of the main things that I, this is a bad habit that I try to break people up. Is that I don't want somebody to sit and have to watch a dashboard because that takes an engineer out of engineering pool and puts them on babysitting duty and just has them watching a graph move. And I don't really find that 
very enjoyable to just watch a graph move. Um, but, you know, it's really interesting. Like, how do we not just sit and watch a graph move? Yeah, I think the only caveat there, and it's really about having all these pieces come together to, to make a successful team and successful practice, is that you do need to be comfortable with the data. And so if you don't have explorable dashboards and you don't have the kind of built-in curiosity, you know, in the process of developing new features where people are checking the impact on certain metrics and on logs and on outputs and things while they're developing, then if you end up in a situation where something goes wrong, people are going to be kind of blind. They're not going to know how to use the systems or how to use the tools. When you build in that, that exploration and that curiosity early on, then sitting and watching dashboards doesn't really, as you said, doesn't really provide you value because you already have your skill set in those tools when you need to. And hopefully you have a way of, of letting you know when that dashboard should get your attention when something goes wrong. And so right. the one problem is the only caveat is if you don't have that culture of working in these tools day in and day out, then taking time to look at them on a regular basis is valuable for when things go wrong. Um, Absolutely. But, it's about doing the right work at the right time, I think. Yeah. So what's the solution to all of this, right? Like how do you get away from using too many dashboards? How do you get away from too much noise and not enough information? And so the process that I like to use is to simply use SLOs, right? Like I like to, you know, identify those really good SLIs, um, you know, and, and, you know, every SLI is a metric. Not every metric is an SLI, right? And then we build SLOs and we set, you know, obtainable targets for those SLOs. And then we let our SLO system that we set up kind of tell us when to do what work, right? And if everything's going swimmingly, hey, everybody can work on more meaningful engineering work. We can work on writing better tests. We can work on writing better features, uh, you know, adding, adding value to our system. And then when we start trending in the wrong direction, rely on our SLOs to tell us that and alert us and say, hey, you're burning through your error budget 2x of what you should be. Okay, now we need to look. And I think that's where we let the SLO tell us what work we need to do. Um, and so we use those SL SLOs. We let engineers get back to being engineers and doing meaningful engineering work and not um, you know, needlessly worrying about reliability or not needlessly you know, watching a dashboard because like you said, we've built up that muscle. We've built up that comfort in using our metrics tools uh, so that we know how to use them. We only need to use them when we need to use them. Um, I think that's a, I think this is the hardest part to get to is to let go of, I've got to watch, I've got to know what everything is doing. And I think that's where SLOs do a great job. Um, and so, you know, this begs to be said that, you know, when something bad happens, and it will happen, right? Like your service will go down. You will experience an interruption or disruption. That's when your dashboards are your most valuable, right? I think this is basically what we've been talking about the whole time is that, you know, having the right information in these dashboards and having our dashboards configured uh, to where they're meaningful to us lets us go in and use them when we really need them most, when we are in violation of an SLO or approaching a violation um, so that we can go explore this data and figure out what's going on. Um, I know this is how, you know, my groups, this is how we use SLOs. We use them as uh, to tell us when to do what work. Um, I'm curious as to, you know, what your thoughts, thoughts are on incident response and, and how you leverage metrics and logs and, and, and dashboards in, you know, responding to something. Yeah, I think that there is that incident side, but just to say on how to prioritize when to do work, I think that's so powerful because if you listen to really senior engineers speak about what, you know, advice to their younger self or advice to, to newer engineers, often one of the conversation topics is about how to make a case for technical work, how to make, how to, how to discuss when to work on what pieces. And I think this is where you can start to, allow SLOs to, to work towards that incident response, which we can talk about, but also towards like kind of BAU tech debt conversations to start having conversations of where things are starting to chip away at the SLO. It might not be a burn rate you're, you're calling an incident, but you could 
improve these things to, to set yourself up better. Or maybe you've had to set an SLO at a, a level that you're un, unhappy with and you can do certain work to improve that. And this is gonna start that conversation with the, the people who help prioritize work that can take in user facing features and tech debt and actually see that impact and why you would prioritize what might be very technical as a solution um, to do work, but. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I, like I love that thought, right? Because fundamentally like our dashboards and to have them be really, really meaningful to engineers, they're going to be complex, right? And like our, our work is not easy. Uh, and so I think one of the things that we can do with SLOs is make that, the concept of an SLO and a breach or a trend in the wrong direction, even if it's not a trend that is alarming to the point where we need to stop feature work. Um, I think what SLOs allow us to do is make that digestible to non-engineers, right? To business exactly. users or business uh, business owners that can say, hey, look, we're moving in the wrong direction. We can start this conversation and then we can start the conversation with an SLO and then point to our dashboards, the, the, the meaningful information and say, we're burning faster than we thought we would be. We're not in danger. But now let's look at these dashboards and you can see we have issues here, here, and here. Let's get this work scheduled so that we can approach this work, get this done, figure it out before an incident happens, right? Like I know I don't like getting woken up in the middle of the night to respond. I did that for, I did that for a long time. I don't want to do it anymore. And so I want to catch all my problems before they become problems so that we can work on them during business hours. Um, yeah. because I, you know, I don't want to get a page. I, I get, you know, a minimal amount of sleep as is. Um, so yeah, I love this conversation. Uh, I really, really enjoyed you, you talking about this with me. Um, no, I think, um, I think this has been really good. I really appreciate the invite to, to come and have this chat and engage with slow comp. I'm really excited to, to be in person and chatting with everybody on the day. So, um, hopefully this will start some good conversations. I'm looking forward Excellent. to it. Again, I'm Zach. She's Abby. We hope you enjoyed it.